Hello, I'm Andreas Kalos, and today I'm going to be giving you a short presentation of my artificial intelligence group project that we had this spring. Um, it was over reinforcement learning, and we were given a two-agent transportation world to work with. So basically, our goal was to have our agents pick up items from pickup points and then deliver them to drop-off points, and then for them to get more and more efficient over time as um, each episode was completed. Um, so we can look at our world here. Um, we were given a 5x5 five five grid with four drop-off points noted in green, and then two pickup points noted in blue. Um, each pickup point would have 10 items in them to start off with, and the drop-off points would be empty, and the goal to, of each episode or terminal state reach was to deliver all of the items from each pickup point into the drop-off points. Um, and as you can see, the drop-off points have a capacity of five blocks. So basically at the end of an episode, the both pickup points will have zero blocks, and then each of the four drop-off points will have five blocks. Um, we were tasked with using the Q-learning temporal difference and SARSA approaches to calculate our Q values. Uh, and SARSA is a non-policy, and then Q-learning is an off-policy algorithm, which basically means that it's just the way that they update their Q values. Uh, so for a non-policy, uh, it would use the current or the next state, and then the current policies action, while the off policy will use the next state and the greedy policy action to determine its Q values. So let's take a look at some code. Um, basically, uh, let's start off with our visualization. So to help us visualize what's happening in the world and to debug and see errors, we uh, used Pygame. Uh, it's it, it's an open source package for Python uh, that we use. So not too much of this code is too complicated or anything that you can't really find online. Um, we had some custom stuff in here, like we did, made each agent their own separate color, and the pickup points have colors, and then we uh, created our 5x5 five five grid, and then um, we denoted the objects with circles uh, that needed to be picked up and moved, so you can see when we're running some of our experiments uh, where those are going and how those are moving. Uh, but for the most part, this is just uh, some basic Pi game stuff, and um, nothing too complicated. So let's get into the actual and gritty code so um for our two agents we created classes for them uh they had attributes uh, like has block so uh, we could tell whether or not that agent has a block or not which could that could change which ap applicable actions we can do um then we of course have their positions and those are that you can see here are their starting points and then we also have an last operand attribute which is stores the last move that they made um we can see the pickup and drop-off code. So the pickup points are just also classes. Um, they have an attribute for location, and then they have an attribute for the current amount of blocks that are in that point. Uh, the same thing for drop-off. It's a class with location and the blocks. And of course, the blocks in each drop-off point for, are going to start off at zero initially because um, that's where the drop-off point is. Uh, and then we can see our helpers. Um, in our helpers functions here, we have are six defined actions. So in this world, we have up, down, left, right, pick up, and drop off are the applicable actions. Um, and then we have our applicable operands, which is basically a function that determines which um, moves this agent can make at this current time. So say you have one of the agents in the bottom left corner of your grid. Well, you can't go down or left, so those are not applicable operands. So this would remove um, those operands and any of those that are not applicable, so we don't choose an action that's not possible for an agent. Um, then we've got the next get next location function, which is just um, it, it, it takes in the applicable operands um, or, or the agent himself to check whether or not it can make these moves. And if it does, then uh, or if it is able to make it those moves, then it'll choose from these uh, options, um, and it will update the grid accordingly. Uh, and then we have this, the same exact function for our, our Sarsa. We just decided to make another function for it. Um, and then we, of course, has we have a function to check whether or not we are in a terminal state or a terminal state has been reached. And like I said earlier, that basically means that all the pickup points have been emptied and all the drop-off points have been filled. And I forgot to note, but that also means that there are no blocks on an agent because there could be no pickup uh, blocks left, but... Uh, one of the agents could have a block on them, and if we don't make sure that that's also a check, then it could falsely finish that episode and then move on to the next one. Um, now let's get into what 
the policies we're using. Uh, so most of the time for just normal Q learning, you're using a greedy setup, uh, P epsilon or an epsilon P greedy kind of um, policy. But uh, we were tasked with having three different policies. And the first one we had to implement was P random, which is basically just uh, from the applicable operands list, just take a random uh, choice every time, random action every time. So if we say the mail agent is uh, in the middle of the, uh, the entire grid, then all of the options are applicable um, in terms of moving left, right, up, or down. Um, so it's going to choose randomly between those four actions. Um, and also if pick up or drop off, and or drop off were applicable, uh, those would also be random. So even if a agent is on a pickup point and does not have a block, uh, it does not guarantee that it will pick up the block and then go on from there. So right off the bat, we can expect that PRandom probably will not perform very well as it doesn't even take into account Q values uh, when determining the action of the agent. So um, we can expect that one to be pretty bad. Uh, so let's move to the next one, which is P greedy. Uh, this is more of a, you know, similar to just the normal type of Q learning algorithm when you uh, first hear about it and learn about it. Um, it basically just takes the, from the applicable operands list, the highest Q value action, and then chooses that one every time. So um, we can expect this one to perform pretty well. Um, most likely, uh, there is one, a chance that sometimes the agents will get in suboptimal loops, depending on how the uh, the Q values are implemented. But in our case, we were able to um, get get past that and make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and then we'll move the P exploit, which is basically a combination of P greedy and P random. Uh, so from the applicable operands, you choose an, with an eighty percent probability the highest Q value action. And then with a 20% probability, you randomly choose any of the other applicable operands that are not the highest Q value. Um, so it, it still implements that element of randomness. So we can expect this policy to perform not quite as good as P greedy, but still perform better than P random. And it also has that element of randomness to prevent uh, any suboptimal loops from forming. Um, so now uh, let's move into, into some running some experiments. So setup for these experiments was pretty similar throughout. Um, each one starts off with uh, 500 steps of using the P random policy. Uh, that helps us initialize Q values and get some uh, Q values set up to help the agents actually traverse the world. Uh, otherwise, it might be kind of difficult because all the reward values that are set up in the initialized world are pretty static. So it, it might get confused and easily get stuck into a suboptimal loop. Um, so basically what we do is we come in, we set up our world, uh, initialize our drop-off and pickup locations, um, initialize our female and male agents, uh, and then we of course create our state spaces if, as a dictionary. And these state spaces basically hold uh, what's currently happening in that world at each step. So after one step, then that's going to be a new state space. And um, it's going to store the respective values of our pickup and drop-off points and the agents' actions, as well as the Q values at each step. Um, and then we move actually into the, uh, the looping part where we're actually performing actions. So uh, in our for loops, we have everything divided by two because the way we did our agents' actions is uh, we did them simultaneous instead of one at a time. So um, 500 steps is actually... 250 steps, but the, each agent is moving at the same time. So it's two actions. Um, so that's how we set that up. Um, and then, of course, we have a right at the beginning of our flip, we have a check for whether or not we're in a terminal state. Uh, and once that happens, we would iterate uh, or increment our episode counter uh, and then move to a, a completely new initialized world. So we would reset the agent's positions as well as the blocks back into the pickup points and then empty the drop off points and then we would start over again um, and then we just keep running that until we reach our maximum number of steps which would be uh 500 in the first for loop and then 7500 in the second for loop so then 20 or 8000 uh total steps would happen in each run of, the, of this type of experiment um, and then getting past this terminal state which is just resetting everything and then incrementing what we need 
uh, we see our female and agent are being uh, their values or Q values are being updated, uh, as well as implementing our current policy. So it's p random in this one, um, and the the Q values don't matter in p random. We just implemented them here so we could see what was whole going on, uh, anyways. But yeah, for p random, the Q values are not being taken into account in any of the choices for the uh, agent's actions. So this is a uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter in this case but uh, uh we can keep going down now we've entered the for loop that's using p random once again for 7500 steps uh it's the same exact for loop as above it's checking if there's a terminal state at the top and then if there is it's resetting everything um and then once again we're checking the female agent's q values and updating them accordingly and updating state space um and then we get down to the bottom here and then it's just some output and uh, formatting print for the key values and then some graphs so we can we can do a run and i can show you first how the uh the pi game works and what it looks like so we can see here that the four dark blue spots are drop off points the two light blue points are pickup points and then the uh dark pink and the green uh moving squares are agents so as we can see they are picking up points from the drop off over the pickup points and then moving them to the drop off points and in a second we can see a reset here so you know, the terminal state was reached and then it uh the positions of the agents are reset as well as the blocks in each uh drop off point are moved out and then back into the pickup points and then a new episode begins and this is running pretty slowly so now that we see what pi game kind of looks like i'm going to stop this run and then turn up the speed that it will tick at and that way we can at least see the output of each experiment. So as we can see, it's just once again, the agents are trying to do their job and deliver the pickup uh, pick blocks to the drop-off blocks. And we can also see in the console the amount of steps it's taking for each episode. Um, so we can see here that it's not really ever going down and it's not really staying at a static number. So it's from this graph, you can also really tell that the p random policy is pretty inefficient and the agents never really learn anything so it's they're just randomly making choices and it, it just takes a lot of time for them to make uh or to deliver blocks and finish an episode so as we can see uh we, we, we're going to compare this graph to the next run which is going to be using p greedy and see how much how much better that one performs so let's go to the next one and this code is exactly the same as the previous code it's just that uh now we are using the p greedy uh in the, in the uh, 7500 steps after the first 500 steps instead of p random now so that again is going to be choosing the highest q value action available to that agent every time so uh we should expect this to perform much better than the previous policy but again all of this code is exactly the same except for that um and then we can see here that the uh, the Q values are being updated for each agent and then we're putting them into their list and then uh, calculating the Q values that for the new state space. And then um, we're going to take that into account every single time we make a decision. So let's do a run and see how we perform. So you can see the first step, of course, takes a long time because it's still using that element of P random uh, for the first 500 steps to initialize Q values and start getting the agents set up and rolling. But as you can see from what's happening in the console, that each step is, or each episode is taking a lot less steps than was happening previously and over time from the beginning. So as we can see from this graph, clearly this is a much better performing policy than PRandom. We have got 28 episodes completed instead of, I think it was previously seven in PRandom. Mm -hmm. And the trend is definitely down. And the spikes are a lot less different um, in value from the previous uh, episode completed than uh, was in random for sure. So we can see from this that definitely this is a better performing policy than PRandom. Um, so let's move to experiment 1C, which is using uh, P exploit instead of P greedy. So again, it's the same exact code, except for the second for loop with the 7,500 steps after the first uh, steps of random, uh, we use P exploit, um, which again is with that 80% probability that we choose the highest Q value action and then a 20% probability that we randomly choose between any of the other applicable actions. Um, so we can expect this to perform definitely better than the P random policy, but most likely 
slightly worse or a, a decent degree worse than uh, Pete Reedy. So let's do a run and see. Um, the first episode takes a while, of course, with that P random 500 steps. And then, as we can see, it is learning. It's taking more steps than Pete Reedy for sure. We'll let this complete. And yeah, so we got 19 episodes completed. Uh, from the graph, you can see that it is a downward trend in terms of steps taken per episode um, to complete, but uh, it's it's still very spiky. Um, it's going up and down a lot between each episode complete uh, as compared to Greedy, where it was pretty, pretty minimal, the difference in degree of uh numbers of steps taken between each uh, episode um but so we got about 28 episodes completed on our p greedy run seven on our p random and then 19 on our p exploit so it's right in the middle currently of performance so this is definitely preferred policy over p random but still not as good as p greedy uh so now let's take a look at our sarsa um code which again is for the most part exactly the same code as our previously ran experiments but um, it's just going to be using the Sarsa uh, policy now. Um, but our Sarsa was tasked to use with P exploit. So the, the difference between Q-learning and Sarsa is the way it calculates the Q values as stated before. So it's still using the same policy of P exploit, but it's using it for Sarsa this time. So um, as we can see, it, it, it's likely going to perform a lot better um, than at least P random and the normal P exploit as the way that Sarsa calculates its Q values is more realistic as it takes the next action. So um, this is probably going to perform even better than our uh, P greedy policy. So let's have a run and check it out. So yeah, as we can see from the terminal already, it's performing quite, quite fast. Um, episodes are being completed quite quickly and it's, it's performing very well. Uh, we're likely going to have quite a few episodes completed from this run. We can see from the graph. Yeah, so we completed 50 episodes. Um, now, of course, it, it does seem like it is quite a, spiky in terms of the uh, episode or steps taken per episode. Uh, but we also have to take into account that this graph is displaying on the same size graph a lot more episodes completed. So the the amount of steps it's taking in between from the spikes is, is pretty exaggerated. But uh, it, the spikes are still there. But this definitely seems to be performing much better than our other policies. Um, so let's move into one of our next experiments, which is experiment three. Uh, and this is the exact same experiment as experiment 1C, which is just using random for the first 500 steps and then an exploit for the next 7,500 steps. But instead, we've changed the uh, learning uh, variable, the learning rate variable, uh, to 0.15, which originally was 0.13. So... We should expect from that uh, that we're going to have less episodes completed and it's going to take longer to complete uh, episodes because uh, the, of the lower learning rate value. So let's give this a run and see what happens. So as we can see, it is learning. Um, it is doing much better than PRandom was for sure, but it does seem to be taking more time than p exploit was originally to complete each episode uh i think that we had 19 episodes in the p exploit of 0 0.13 learning rate uh and now we have 17 episodes so again we can see it's it's definitely a downwards trend in uh the number of steps taken for each episode but uh it is very spiky still and it is more so spiky than it was before um and we have completed less episodes so this seems to be falling in line with how we expect it to perform. Um, the next experiment is the exact same experiment, except we change the learning rate from 0 0.3 to 0 0.45. So we should expect this one to perform at least better than our 0.15 and most likely better than our 0 0.30 uh, learning rate runs as well. Um, but it should still be pretty close to the at least the 0.31. Um, so we'll see how this one plays out. It does seem to be performing decently well and it does seem to be performing better than at least the 0.15 run uh yes so we had 23 episodes completed in this run 
Um, and then, yeah, so we had 19 completed in our 0.13 run, so it performed four episodes better or more. Um, we still have the downward trend, and it is a little bit less spiky throughout um, the entire run, but it does have those spikes still present. So that element of randoms is still coming into play very evidently here. Um, so we'll move to our last experiment, which is just uh, us using the p random uh, and p exploit policies. Um, but in this experiment, instead of running from just number of steps, we are going to run p random for the first 500 steps still. But uh, after that, we split we uh, change to p exploit. But instead of running for 7,500 steps, we just run until we've reached a third terminal state. And then after we reach that third terminal state, we then swap where the drop-off points or the pickup points are at um, on the grid. So uh, we it, basically this experiment is testing to see how well um, the agents can learn from change or can adapt to change, that is. Uh, so again, it's the first 500 steps are going to be using pRandom, and then we swap to pExploit after that. And then once a third terminal state is reached, we switch where the pickup points are, and then we run until the sixth terminal state. And let's give it a run and see how it performs. Um, most likely, the agents will get kind of confused and then maybe get stuck in some, some optimal loops and then take a long time to complete an episode, especially once the, uh, the pickup points change, and then they're going to have to learn... Um, uh, it's going to take them some time. So it's going to, it might take a lot of steps to finish this here. As we can see, they are really confused um, and they're having some trouble. They haven't even been able to hit that top left one yet at all. This is going to be a very poorly performing run, actually. Um, maybe we try and do another one instead. Just to see, I mean, as we can see, that was that was taking well over ten thousand steps to even do four terminal states. So uh, we we can see that clearly, uh, at least with the policies we're currently using, that uh, the agents have trouble adapting to change and likely would have to implement some other uh, ways to have them learn better. But this time it ran a lot better, um, so we just got lucky again because the agents just found ways and the right paths to take. So this one only took about 5,600 steps and completed the six episodes. But we can see that it is very spiky and there's uh, not a lot of learning going on too much because the, um, the agents just really uh, have some trouble adapting to that change. So um, anyways, that's all I'd like to show for my project. Uh, I thought this was a very interesting project. I learned a lot about um, just in general learning, reinforcement learning, but a lot about artificial intelligence as well. I hope you enjoyed and thank you very much.